welcome to High Noon, where we talk about controversial subjects with interesting people. Um, so happy to have Heather McDonald back on the show, um, especially given the important subject of, of her latest book. Um, Heather is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, a contributing editor at City Journal. Uh, and her newest book is When Race Trumps Merit. Uh, I think addressing, if not the central issue of our times, at least uh, a central issue of our time. And I think she argues pretty convincingly that it is the central issue of our time. So welcome Heather to High Noon. I'm so pleased to have you back on. It's great to be with you Inez and thank you for the kind words. Yeah, so I wanna start with how you start your book um, because you you talk about uh, basically, you talk about the summer of 2020, the, the summer of Floyd, if you will, um, as a moment of cultural revolution. Uh, I, I, myself and, and my husband, when we were talking about it at the time, we said we, we feel like we're living through a regime change, like that something is fundamentally, we've reached some kind of fundamental tipping point. Uh, there are statues coming down, half the country is on fire. It seems like every single institution is, is coming out with a nearly identical statements, right? Or repeating the sacred words um, about how America is a systemically racist country. Um, why do you choose to begin the book with, with this uh, tipping point uh, and, and what does it say about the setup of, of your premise that, that in fact, uh, the idea of disparate impact um, is is now sort of the default setting uh, in American society? Well, it was the moment where the idea that any racial disparity in an institution, uh, you know, if there's an underrepresentation of black computer engineers at Google compared to their portion in the population at large, or an overrepresentation of blacks in prison compared to their population at large. It was the moment when that idea that that meant racism, that the only allowable explanation for racial disparities in an institution is racism, became adopted by every elite a mainstream institution. And that's what makes this revolution so very bizarre, Inez, because we usually think of revolutions as, as against the power structure, you know, some excluded marginalized group, uh, the poor or, you know, bourgeois that feel like they haven't gotten their rights sufficiently, as we saw in 19th century, you know, revolutions, 1848 uh, and, and 1830. Uh, it, it's, it's against the ruling class. And what was so bizarre about the George Floyd mass hysteria, mass psychosis, was that it was the most powerful, secure institutions that themselves embraced this fantastical lie that they were racist, even though there's not a single mainstream institution that is not twisting itself into knots to hire and promote as many remotely qualified Blacks and other underrepresented minorities as possible. And yet here were the, our elites saying, we're racist and more importantly, you guys are really, really racist. Uh, and so that has had enormous consequences. It is not, as, as we were saying before, it's not unprecedented. These trends have been a long time in making. The idea of racial preferences, of uh, celebrating an anti-success culture, that's been going on both in the corporate world and in academia for a long time. But what was different about uh, the, the George Floyd mass meltdown was its volume and the effects it has had uh, on tearing down meritocratic standards at a really, really fast rate, whether it's in sciences or when it comes to behavior in criminal law. Yeah, I think you make a really critical observation that is at once sort of obvious when we look around at our post 2020 world, um, but is somehow under discussed even on the right. Um, so, for example, you know, I'm sure you're very familiar with with Christopher Caldwell's thesis in Age of Entitlement, and there's a lot of focus on reforming the the Civil Rights Act, at least among people who are, let's say, a part of the the right wing spectrum that is is, is not itself uh, sort of covering its language. Um, and we'll get to that in a moment, but you make this very critical observation that it's jumped from law, in other words, the civil rights law, and, and you, you cite some of the cases that, that use disparate impact analysis, and that underlying assumption that actually, if if there are, are not perfectly matching to the population, sort of quota numbers in anything, that, that it must be due to discrimination. 
So that idea jumps to, you know, regulations, dear colleague letters from the Department of Education, as you point out, right? Um, but, but you make a third point about this, which is you say, now it's basically a free floating principle in operation, either explicitly or, or implicitly everywhere, in private institutions, in public institutions, every, in this kind of self critique that you, you are talking about has made its jump to sort of widespread culture totally separate from whatever the Civil Rights Act does or doesn't say, or whatever the, the Department of Education issues in terms of your colleague letters. Right. Disparate impact concept arose as a, a legal concept within the law. It was the result of a, of a lawsuit that was brought against a company uh, that was not affirmatively discriminating, but the company had an employment test that assumed a certain degree of literacy and blacks failed that test at a higher rate than whites. There was nothing discriminatory about the test and the employer did not intend to exclude blacks. Uh, but because the test had a so-called disparate impact on blacks, it had to be thrown out uh, absent any a sh very high showing of business necessity. Uh, and, and that concept, as you say, Inez, did then enter code of federal regulations, statutes picked it up. Uh, but now you have, you know, cooking magazines they're not being sued by anybody, but they're getting out there and saying, we're discriminating because we don't have enough blacks on our staff. There must be some kind of racism here or, uh, you know, a law firm that has a certain expectation of uh, ability to draft documents. If that expectation has a disparate impact on black associates, the law firm will voluntarily, absent any litigation, declare itself as racist, promise to make amends. Uh, and so you could, it, it would be good to get rid of the disparate impact concept in the law. And I advocate doing that. You know, the, a, a federal a president could start rulemaking that would get rid of every place disparate impact shows up in federal regulations. He could urge a Congress to change those statutes. But at this point, we have to do the work as well, Inez, because as you say, it's in the culture. And what I do in this book is propose an alternative explanation for racial disparities. They are not the result of racism. They are the result of, on the one hand, very, very large academic skills gaps that make it simply ludicrous to expect that absent racism, you would have proportional representation in highly demanding meritocratic jobs. And the other explanation I propose for the overrepresentation of blacks in the criminal justice system is very high rates of criminal offending. This may strike your, your listeners in as as like self-evident, like you have to write a book about that? Come on, obviously there's higher rates of crime. Well, it is not so obvious. Uh, the, the defenses, the denials that I have encountered over and over again, talking about black on black crime are mind boggling. So it needs to be said, it's difficult to say, it makes people uncomfortable, understandably, to talk about these skills and behavior gaps, racial etiquette advocates against doing so. And I appreciate the rationale for racial etiquette, but at this point, the hour is late and we cannot allow ourselves to be silenced by phony charges of racism by talking about facts. Facts are not racist. I, I wanna talk about one perhaps surprising group of people who is engaging in that inability to just talk about baseline rates, whether that's about criminality or how many academically prepared kids of any given racial group there are, right? Um, and, and that's that's the conservative institutions. That's on the right. Because I, I remember one of the most depressing things about, you know, living through the riots in the summer of Floyd in 2020 um, were the number of conservative institutions that, for example, released those sort of creepily verbatim statements about systemic racism in america and how we have to do better um as institutions to, to uh, purge the sin of systemic racism from ourselves you know what accounts for uh even institutions that are are 
declaredly on the right, you know, um, the, <laughs> What's that that rule? Like every institution that's not explicitly right wing will move left wing over time. Well, here we have explicitly right wing institutions kind of getting caught up in this cultural revolutionary mania um, in in 2020. I mean, what does that say about the state of the right? Well, it says that I guess it the uh, being white is more important than being right. White people are just extremely guilty. And they're also terrified uh, just as much as the left is apparently that the academic skills gap is never going to close, that this problem is always going to be with us. And so they are just as eager to prolept proleptically put out the only allowable explanation as racism in order not to look head on at the pathological inner city culture that is driving these racial disparities. And everybody is terrified to death of, of anybody even going near heritability. Uh, but you don't need to do that because the cultural disparities are so big. So uh, it is unfortunate uh, and because caving into that analysis does put everything that conservatives value at risk. But I was talking to another big name in the conservative uh, podcast and, and speech world who told me that after he'd given a speech, a supporter of his organization came up to him and said, you know, I love everything you do, but I really don't like it when you talk about race. That's racist. And and this is somebody who is, his, his supporters are going to be very on board, a very, very conservative um, uh, platform. And, and they should know that they're going to get the truth from this guy. But it makes even conservatives flinch. Well, you know, again, as I say, the time for racial etiquette is over. It's very bizarre to me, the self-canceling uh, attitude of, of many whites that they go around being d d called racist and white supremacist by Joe Biden every couple of weeks. Uh, the New York Times, all it needs to do is, is label an in individual or an institution white, and they have immediately discredited that individual and institution. Uh, and, and yet, you know, we, we put up, put up with that. I, it was extraordinary to me when Biden's inaugural speech was greeted both by CNN and the New York times and by even Ben Shapiro of the daily wire. And I have to say daily wire published my book, uh, Bill McGurn at the wall street journal. They all, they all celebrated uh, Joe Biden's inauguration speech as unifying, transcending differences. The conservatives didn't hear in that speech that Biden was hammering his usual theme about white supremacy. So whites at this point just take it as a matter of course that everybody's going to accuse them of being, uh, you know, the source of this enduring stain on America's soul, as Biden put it. And they don't mind. They kind of say, yeah, I guess we deserve it. And they go on with it. Uh, but but identity politics, it is going to come full circle. You know, if every other ethnic racial group gets to say, well, we have a racial identity, it may be just a matter of time and maybe not. I mean, maybe whites are going to be endlessly self-flagellating and prost prostrating themselves. But some are going to say, OK, well, Maybe I'm not going to embrace a white identity, but it is sure legitimate and long past time to start defending Western European civilization. So let's talk about some of the consequences of what you're terming racial etiquette, right? Um, some of the consequences of, of accepting across pretty much the entire mainstream political spectrum um, and in business and elsewhere in, in just institutions, private institutions in America this underlying disparate impact sort of premise, right? Um, I mean, you divide your book into the sciences, including medicine, which is a particularly scary thought, um, and then the arts, and then go move to crime and punishment, essentially. Um, so, I mean, you, this this book is like really exhaustive. I really recommend it to my listeners. I mean, you, you have, have gone through into every institution and sort of cataloged a thousand different uh, examples of, of how um, this kind of thinking has destroyed the merit and the output 
the scientific advancement, right? Um, any output of these institutions has been uh, really damaged by this. But why don't you give us a few examples? Let's start with the science and medicine category. Well, as I say, the, the origins of disparate impact was that if a test, if, if blacks failed a test at a higher rate, you had to get rid of the test. You didn't say, well, maybe they don't have the same level of academic skills. No, we blame the test. So that's going on in medicine now. And, and again, uh, your viewers and listeners, Inez, should really think hard about whether this is the, the road they want to go down or whether it's time to start fighting back. Uh, law schools use something called the Medical College Admissions Test, the MCATs, to uh, sort students for admission. It's like the SATs. It's an objective, colorblind, computer-graded exam that tests uh, you know, basic concepts in math, reading, uh, you know, it's not heavily medical because you haven't gone to medical school yet, but it's, it's testing people's capacity to learn. And blacks fail the MCAT or do more poorly on the MCAT than other groups. So again, we've decided the problem is the test. Now I can guarantee you, Inez, that the MCATs are not racist. They do not contain racist questions. They do not contain questions that assume any kind of racial or, or economic background. In fact, any test that any question that has a particularly disparate impact on blacks is just thrown out, it, presumably because it's just too difficult, but they just throw it out. And they've actually rejiggered the MCATs recently to put more emphasis on sort of psychological aspects that are irrelevant to whether you can learn the nitty gritty of, of uh, self functioning and and the you know, how neurons work in the brain. So some schools have said we're just waiving the MCATs completely for certain black students. Uh, others just employ vastly different standards. They will admit black applicants that have MCATs and GPAs that would be almost automatically disqualifying if presented by whites and Asians. And then not surprisingly, once those preference beneficiaries enter medical school, uh, a school for which they are not competitively qualified. Now they would have been competitively qualified if they'd entered a school without racial preferences, but the way our system works now, blacks are almost universally catapulted into schools where they start out at a competitive disadvantage. And so they don't do as well in subsequent measures of medical knowledge. There's a, something called step one of the US medical licensing exam that is a test taken after the second year of medical school that tests what students should have learned in their classes about anatomy, about drug interactions. Here again, blacks ended up at the bottom of the grading scale, at the grading curve. So what do we do? We don't say, well, let's rethink racial preferences uh, let's get rid of the grading on the step one of the U.S. medical licensing exam. So last year, step one went pass fail. So we no longer have any ability to figure out how much students have learned. It's just this very gross uh, distinction between pass and fail. And the problem was blacks were not getting their favored residencies. So now those residencies won't be able to select as, you know, with as much precision or any degree of knowledge, their students. This can, is going to continue and continue. Other, other tests of medical knowledge are under fire. Uh, they will all go down. We're changing the curriculum to put in more uh, critical race theory, more implicit bias, more intersectionality. It's all a zero sum. Every hour that a student spends learning about intersectionality is an hour not spent learning how to save you when you come into the emergency room. Uh, with a critical car crash uh, destroying your body. Uh, so, you know, this is something that is going to have very real wor world consequences in the future. Yeah, I, I had Aaron Sibarium on here, um, and he's done some great reporting, specifically in medical schools and some elsewhere. I think a lot of you've cited, I'm sure you've cited him. I didn't look at the, the footnotes, but I'm sure that some of this uh, journalistic work that you cite in this book uh, is is from him. No, actually not. Yeah. No? <laughs> I did really? it myself. No, oh, you did all of it yourself. Yeah, yeah, I've, I preceded him. Uh, <laughs> well, um, 
we we talked about on this podcast uh we called it the the planes falling out of the sky sort of tipping point um you know at what point do the outcomes in these institutions um and start to take a marked decline and even at that point will we just find other reasons to sort of um excuse it right so obviously if you are admitting uh, less qualified surgeons to a surgical residency program, the outcomes in that surgical residency program will decline over time. But th the reason we brought up the planes example is, let's say now, and I don't know the exact numbers, but let's say now um, there are, I don't know, one plane crash a year that's due to pilot error, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's say there are two, that would be an increase, right? A, a doubling of the plane crashes. But each individual crash, you can, you know, say, okay, well, there was a miscommunication with the tower. Like this, it, it's very difficult to, um, in a rich and, and successful society, right, uh, to, to pinpoint why outcomes are declining. Now, it makes basic common sense um, that, there, that there would be a decline in outcomes if there's a decline in standards. But given all the silence around this topic and the fear of speaking out even on the right, I mean, do you have hope that even sharp declines in output that think in ways that really impact Americans lives like you know what happens when they show up at the emergency room after a car crash even that will will actually point us back to a conversation about this this sort of conspiracy of silence and, and underlying disparities or are we just going to like find some other excuse for it well on the analogy with crime I'm not optimistic uh, because with crime, we see the absolute bodies falling out of the sky. When the police backed off for the second iteration of the Ferguson effect, which I wrote about with the initial one, was after the the uh, Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson, Missouri in, in August of 2014 that led to depolicing across the country following the following riots. And you had a sharp spike in homicides. Uh, but that didn't change our narrative about a racist criminal justice system. And then after George Floyd race riots, you had an even more acute uh, depolicing and the largest one year increase in homicide in this nation's history. You can see the bodies. I mean, you can just count them. This amount of surplus, mostly black bodies that were killed because prosecutors stopped prosecuting the law. Uh, enforcing the law in the name of disp avoiding disparate impact. Police chiefs told their officers, stop making arrests for trespass, uh, you know, turnstile jumping, fair beating, resisting arrest, uh, uh, drug dealing, theft. All of this matters to the criminal environment. And yet we're still going around talking about racist police officers. Uh, so now, one thing you could say there is that when the police back off of policing, overwhelmingly the disproportionate number of victims are going to be black because that's where crime is happening most. It's black on black shootings. Whites are not shooting blacks. Police officers are not shooting blacks. Blacks die of homicide between the ages of 10 and 24 at 25 times the rate of whites between the ages of 10 and 24 because they're being killed by blacks at 25 times the rate. Um, but it hasn't mattered now, whether if we had more white victims, if children, if white children were getting gunned down in drive-by shootings, maybe that would change the discourse. It hasn't so far. So whether, and it, it's harder in medicine and in sciences uh, to, to make those connections one can also say, and this is even more subtle, is that for sure it is going to slow down our, our medical progress in making medical breakthroughs of understanding, uh, cancer transmission, uh, Alzheimer's disease, because we have the federal government now saying you should make race of researchers more important is in essence than their medical competency what we care about is the racial demographics of your lab, not whether it is the most uh, scientifically accomplished. That is going to weigh down what we can do. Well, where China is, is, is forging ahead at top rate and doesn't give a damn about identity politics. But in general, no, I am not optimistic. 
until Americans swallow hard and say, yes, we had a terrible past. It was one that contradicted every, every narrative we tell about ourselves as far as being the land of opportunity, the land of hope, to quote a recent textbook by a conservative. Uh, none of that was true with regards to our treatment of blacks. But we are not that country today. We are not that country in the least today. And it is time to be honest about what our real problems are. And those are, a, a, as I say, a pathological inner city culture and an unwillingness to expect everybody to meet standards rather than lowering standards on their behalf. What happens in the crime context? And I, I, I like actually that there, there's a, um, we're listening, I'm talking about crime and there's a, a police siren. Yes, right? of course. Uh, very appropriate, but um, you know, Back, back in the 80s, we had this case in New York of Bernie Getz um, and, and have a, a New York jury basically acquit on the premise that crime and disorder in the city had gotten so bad um, that merely observing young black men positioning themselves around you in a subway car and one of them walks up to you and asks you for $5, you could reasonably assume you were about to be violently mugged. Um, it seems to me that we're a very, very different country than the one that acquitted Bernie Getz for shooting these guys in the subway car. Um, he was convicted on a, um, he was convicted on, on essentially legal handgun charge and he was civilly sued and, and had to pay, I, or I don't think he ever managed to pay the money, but he, he got a million dollar settlement for the people he shot. Um, but nevertheless, right, this, this jury of New Yorkers, um, in, in the eighties, refused to convict somebody for essentially acting on the evidence of his eyes. Um, what happens to the the next Bernie gets? Because as crime escalates in the cities, it seems to me the chance of somebody um, becoming that next Bernie gets to somebody, and, and maybe um, there's an argument that, that it's already happened multiple times, but I don't think there's been that kind of case that has really risen to national prominence in the same way how will we respond to a 2023 Bernie Getz? Well, <laughs> that's a hilarious and wonderful analogy, um, Inez, and I've never thought about it, but it's a, it's an, it's a fantastic comparison. Uh, we had sort of a Bernie Getz within the last year in New York where there was a Hispanic bodega owner that was being uh, hassled, harassed, threatened by a big guy shoplifting uh, and he the bodega owner stabbed him pulled out his knife and stabbed him turns out fatally uh, and our Manhattan DA charged him initially uh, with murder and there was a big outcry at least in the conservative press like the New York Post saying that this was a understandable act of self-defense and um, so the brag eventually did change the charges. And I think he, the, the shop owner was also thrown in jail without bail as if he was some kind of public threat. Whereas clearly uh, this was a one-off, absolutely sui generis resulting from this particular uh, uh, threat that he faced. He wasn't like a drive-by shooter gang banger that's going out there willy-nilly at a drop of a hat shooting across sidewalks. So that suggests somewhat of a reaction, but there wasn't, I don't think there was the same widespread revulsion. And then, you know, we still are in this mode of denial about what, to the extent that the public knows the degree of crime differences, and I don't think they actually do. Uh, because everybody but the New York Post, and even the New York Post, will no longer say the race of criminals. Here's a, here's a rule of thumb. If in an act of street violence, a shooting, a robbery, a mugging, the race of the criminal is not listed, it's almost 100% certain that it's a black criminal. Because had it been a white criminal, the criminal's race would have been given. Uh, and so even the New York Post now is engaging in this cover up because we all feel so uncomfortable. This began in the 1990s when newspapers stopped giving the race of suspects, 
that were still on the lam, which was a, their failure to give their race was a betrayal of the public trust because if somebody hasn't been arrested yet, you want the public to know every relevant piece of information. And if you're trying to find somebody or, or know who to look for, race is relevant. You've got an individual suspect, his race is relevant. But the newspaper stopped publishing race because they were so uncomfortable with the fact that overwhelmingly the people committing the shootings, the robberies, the shoplifting were black. And that's still going on. Uh, but we saw with the, the Kansas City shooting, which was a tragic shooting, uh, but the 16-year-old Ralph Yarl went to this 84-year-old man's house, uh, mistakenly rang the doorbell. The homeowner says that he was pulling on the door, the, the glass storm door. Yarl, the 16-year-old boy, denies this. Uh, and the 84 year old who's living by himself he's very frail bent over looks like he's maybe early stages of dementia he shot uh through the door at jarl hit him in the head and the leg jarl has been released from the hospital it looks like he'll make a recovery but this was a universally the homeowner shooting was universally attributed to just the rankest racism and, and we had this whole narrative about ringing the doorbell while white, while black, or existing while black, this racial bathos that, that blacks are at risk of their lives from whites, which is preposterous. I wrote an article about this. But let's face the facts. In Kansas City, blacks are nine times as likely to commit homicide as whites. Blacks are about 26.5% of the population. They commit about 75% of all shootings. So if you've got a black guy at night showing up at your door and, and maybe pulling at it, it is not irrational to think that there's a greater chance that that person will be violent. That doesn't mean you justif justify shooting him, but it is perfectly rational and not racist if you know what the facts of crime are, to be more concerned about black teenagers than white teenagers. And the solution to that is not to go around pummeling people for racism, it's to get the crime rate down. If, if blacks committed crime at the same rate of whites, if, if they were not shoplifting, if they were not robbing people, you would not get the phenomenon of the black store patron being followed around by the immigrant bodega store owner or, or pharmacy owner, uh, which makes blacks angry. Well, the, that, that Indian immigrant store owner is simply playing the odds in a completely justified racial, rational manner. So let's get the crime rate down and then you won't see those racial stereotypes. Yeah, I think even Al Sharpton, I can't remember if it was Al Sharpton or one of the other sort of 90s. Uh, Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson, that, yeah, who said that he's, he's relieved when he turns around on the street and the three guys following him are white instead of black. Um, now, now I, I would don't think that even, uh, not only anyone on the left, but anyone on the right uh, in mainstream politics would say something like that. That's right. Uh, so... Let's 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 go to the arts though because we've we've covered we've gone out of order in your book we we first your book goes uh, into science and um, and and medicine uh, then it turns to the arts then uh, it, it closes with the argument on crime so let's let's go back and talk about the arts because in the arts it's more subtle right you you are making an argument here for objectively judging for example the quality of uh you know beethoven symphony versus right some of these contemporary and propped up works and you give several examples of them um i mean this is something has really been annoying me recently because i i moved to new york about two and a half years ago and a huge factor in our decision to move here and really my you know one of, for me was like a top factor i i love the philharmonic here um and for the last year i have barely been able to find anything i want to pay the money to go and allegedly, by the way, they desperately want to, to get the next generation of, of um, you know, symphony goers. And I'm getting advertisements all the time. But every single performance they have has basically has to throw a bone to this sort of 
um, underlying uh, diversity sort of self-flagellation, right? So they might have one piece by a recognizable great composer, and then they'll have two more pieces on the, uh, you know, so half the time I'll be spending in the symphony will be people who wrote in the last 30 years and, and almost always, and I started looking it up and it's like clockwork, it's, it's always a black woman, right? Or a, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because they feel the, the need to do that. I mean, what are the consequences in the arts um, to getting rid of, say, you know, blind auditions um, as, as being proposed in some of these symphonies? What are the consequences of picking sort of nondescript composers from the last 30 or 40 years or plucking from obscurity some composer who, who didn't really stand the test of time merely because of his ethnic background or her ethnic background, right? What are the consequences overall um, in the arts? I mean, they're already, it seems like a lot of these institutions are already struggling uh, to, to continue in the modern world. I mean, it, will this be their their final nail in their coffin or what? Yeah, well, first of all, it's a completely specious argument that if you program black composers, you're going to bring in a black audience that will stay. Uh, that just, that's not what works. The, the solution is more cultural, more classical music training in schools, more presence in the culture. Uh, so, you know, the the idea that you, you program a composer and that's going to bring people back to the concert when it's just a Mozart symphony and a, a Brahms violin concerto and a, and a Dvorak, uh, you know, serenade is wrong. Now, I actually have been going to those New York Philharmonic concerts in as out of a sense of repertorial duty. And actually, I've been surprised. There was one that was an entirely black program. It was called March to Liberation. And I'll be honest, I went thinking I was going to write a, a, a negative review and I wrote a very positive one. Uh, they had a symphony by William Grant Still, the second symphony, that had some fantastic moments. It's, it's um, opening theme uh, was just like an American out right out of the American songbook. Uh, now the, the symphony ultimately became repetitive and tedious as did the other works. And there was another work by a, a more recent black composer, Adolphus Hale Stork, that had some very thrilling moments. What I really object to <laughs> right now, and you, you alluded to this, is the deification of this Joseph Bologna, the so-called Chevalier de Saint-Georges, who was a late 18th century composer, contemporary of Mozart. The hype that is being ladled on this guy is so disgusting. He's an utter mediocrity. I can recognize his music from the first note when it comes on the uh, our local classical music station, WQXR, because of its utter unmitigated banality. Uh, and yet he is actually being said, there's a movie out that just came and unfortunately out of my same sense of duty, I'm trying to work up my self-discipline to go tomorrow night and subject myself to it. I've seen the trailer. It looks like it's gonna be an utter, complete race con job. You know, they claim he's like the most famous composer of the 18th century and we don't know him because of racism. I just did a research through some very standard classical music textbooks uh, the Grove Dictionary. He's not mentioned. He's a non-entity. The and there it matters. Objective, aesthetic judgment matters. You should not be lying about the quality of works. As for the getting rid of blind auditions, you know it's insane. Conductors are not. These are these are the way that, for the last several decades orchestras have selected their, if they have an open seat in the second violin section, they will conduct their auditions behind a screen so that the audition committee doesn't know anything about the person auditioning to, to uh, guard against favoritism. And so the suggestion has been made by the former leading music critic of the New York Times, Anthony Tomasini, to get rid of blind auditions so that orchestras could choose on the basis of race, not merit. This is absurd. There's not a single conductor out there who is discriminating against blacks. A conductor cares about one thing, perfection. He only wants the best musicians. And to make him accept somebody 
on the basis of skin color, not competence, is absurd. What bothers me the most is institutions, and this gets back to the cultural revolution theme that we were talking about earlier, Inez, and the way that our most elite institutions have embraced this phony narrative about ubiquitous racism. The leaders of these arts institutions, whether it's art museums, uh, opera companies, symphony orchestras, dance companies, theater companies, have turned on their own tradition. And they too, in the post George, George Floyd psychotic moment, put out statements saying, 5,000 histories, uh, years of Western art, it's all racist. We are now, our mission is to be anti-racist. It's not to curate art and, and teach you about beauty and why you should be down on your knees in gratitude for these works. It's to condemn our cultural legacy as racist. And that is depriving children of the ability to learn to lose themselves in works of sublimity. Yeah, I'm, I, uh, I'm getting a, an appropriate corrective, and I am ashamed. I think uh, I'm maybe now one of these uh, equivalent to some of the people who underestimated Clarence Thomas in law school because they assumed he was there on affirmative action that so enraged him. You know, that's that's one of the consequences of this regime is that I assumed there was very little merit in a lot of these works. Whereas if we didn't live in such a crazy world, I would have been curious. Right. Um, and yeah, that's a good good corrective for me. Um, not to, to always, not everything is always uh, fits this pattern. Um, well, it can be both. I mean, it can be both. I'm not claiming that the works that I heard are comparable to Brahms uh, or to Stravinsky. I just heard a, an amazing work by Ludoslavsky, Polish 20th century composer, uh, this weekend at the New York Philharmonic, the Concerto for Orchestra. I'm not saying that, you know, they deserve to be in the canon, but it is nevertheless, it's interesting. And I'm always, see, I'm always looking for new repertoire. I actually don't want to go to concerts that feature the canon because I've, I've been listening to it all my life and I'm very much a victim of diminishing returns. So uh, I'm always on the lookout for new music ideally from the 18th and 19th century and not contemporary, you know, serialism, bleep, blop, bloop music. Um, but, but it is, so for me, it's, it's kind of just an interesting way to hear other ways that the classical music tradition expanded. Um, so I'm actually going to a concert this week with a work by George Walker, who is a 20th century black modernist composer. Um, so, but but I, I I don't condemn your view either. I and and of course, it is the inevitable consequence of the racial preference regime. And it's certainly true for females. I mean, every female conductor and composer out there is uh, absolutely the beneficiary of of sex preferences. Um, well, in in one way, you validated in this book my my pre genuine prejudice. Uh, in prejudging exhibits because I was recently in the Met and I walked by uh, without even putting my head into the the origin civiliz what is it um, <laughs> African origin yes. civilization exhibit oh. in the Met. Um, actually, I, I uh, repeat one of my husband's funniest suggestions because in the American wing now in the Met they have these sort of scolding placards um, that said that say the native perspective right because they have a lot of art that centers around the West yeah. um, and the push West and. So the suggestion was to find the op opposing tribe that was warring with that tribe and put the native perspectives. Yeah, those Cheyenne, like they took our land, right? <laughs> um, but but there really is this sort of hall of horrors aspect that that takes away from, especially somebody who was deprived to some extent of of a, a real classical education. And you talk about some of, I read with with jealousy some of the courses that you took in Yale, right? Um, when, when you were there in 1974, um, you know, what is going to happen to the appreciation of these things, especially as we haven't really continued the education on the Western canon of art, when the first somebody's first introduction to a great artwork has to come with a disclaimer about how they should be offended? Yeah, there's no reason that any student would ever lose himself in beauty. You are told to hate, 
you're told to reject, you're told to belittle, and students are given an excuse for their ignorance. You know, I remember before George Floyd, some group of black students somewhere put out this manifesto against the enlightenment concept of truth. And it was terribly written, ungrammatically written, and, and was a rather lame effort to regurgitate standard academic tropes from a you know semi more sophisticated critical discourse uh anti-enlightenment but you can be sure that not a single one of these students had read voltaire or diderot or hume or adam smith uh and they knew nothing about what the enlightenment actually represented within the history of western thought and it was it was groundbreaking it, it gave us ultimately the scientific method and yet these students now feel licensed to reject things that they know nothing about and i think that part of the cultural psychological spiritual malaise of america now which is very troubling the drug addiction is just unparalleled in western civilization and the just the the sort of squalor of child rearing practices part of it is because we're not giving children and parents don't know to give children beauty and innocence and a retreat into an imaginative world we're we're given only guilt self-flagellation or if you're a, one of the seemingly lucky victim groups a sense of resentment and entitlement to complain and entitlement not to succeed uh, so i think that the cultural consequences for the civilization are very large um and yeah you were you were right to avoid that <laughs> that exhibit i mean it's 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 unbelievable because the met is embracing phony history afrocentric discredited history the metropolitan museum of art which is one of our primary uh cultural institutions has thrown its lot into a charlatan afrocentric view of the world in order to make the point that western civilization has its origins in africa it does not and your husband's question about well let's have the the uh, victim tribes view of, of how you know the West was won is absolutely right. The thing that is so nauseating is all the African art in, in the Metropolitan Museum, at the National Gallery, at the Art Institute of Chicago, it is all celebrated without any kind of deconstructive uh, hermeneutics of suspicion. Oh, look at this wonderful warrior bronze. Nobody's gonna say, well, you know what? Uh, the you know head of of Benin or uh, the Dahomey uh, kingdom was massacring his enemies. You know was probably engaged in child sacrifice. No due process. Uh, same with any other civilization, China, Japan. Only the West turns on itself, and there's no protestations on the part of these other cultures no apologies no groveling they're basically saying yeah you don't like our history get over it only the west is de is self-destructing and that self-destruction has to end inez it is not justified we have given the entire world the most fundamental fruits and and gifts of civilization well, let me close on this then. Um, what will happen to, or rather, not only what will happen to, because I think we can guess, but what will they do about it, um, to bright, ambitious, competent, mostly, let's say, young white men in the fields of these fields, right? And what's going to happen to the, the white male artist? What's going to happen to the white male engineer? or, uh, you know, guy who would previously be admitted to, you know, Harvard Medical School. What are all of these 
smart and ambitious. I mean, not there, there's there's sort of one response to this is to write BLM a hundred times on your college applications, right? And and to compete on opening the number of transgender bathrooms that you can open in your school, right? Um, and and there is that competition, but it it can't be lost on the the young strivers of America that uh, there's a limited number of slots for young white men in particular, even if they kowtow to all of the, and they, they say all the right things as, and, and, and cloak their ambition in this kind of social justice language, there's there's a more and more limited number of slots for them in any institutions of, of um, you know, sort of honor and power. What are they going to do? Are they going to build something worthwhile? It seems to me like there's at least some hope there because I just don't, I don't believe that a bunch of 23-year-old, 25-year-old ambitious young men are going to consent that they're in this society, they're, you know, relegated to sort of third rate institutions, that their their um, personal sort of uh, trajectory of their lives is so circumscribed in this way. Very good question. And they certainly are seeing it. A doctor at UCLA said that people, the white males are telling her, we're not going into medicine. We see the writing on the wall. We will be the last hired, the first fired, and, and this is true in every profession, they don't want you. They do not want heterosexual white males. Uh, if you have a son who's a heterosexual white male, good luck to him. I mean, he is screwed until we have the revolution. Um, so I think that what's going on, you posit that they've gotten to the age of 23 or 25 with their self, uh, uh, I don't know, regard intact and aware of their capacities and able to be in some way outraged at their treatment and perceiving it as unfair. I see the entire project of K through 12 to emasculate males and persuade them that they are toxically masculine and that their, their role in life is to lie down and let uh, the marginalized groups walk over them. And I think to a certain extent that's succeeding. You know, we all know these, the, the pajama boy types um, that proudly proclaim themselves feminist and uh, would presumably accept um, playing second fiddle. And I see on the one hand, I'm very troubled when I see institutions now where they're practically all female. I mean, in the ones that I interact with, and I'm not going to name names, the female to male ratio is very high. On the other hand, there are biological realities. On average, men are more interested in public affairs, in data, in facts. They are more risk-taking. They are more entrepreneurial. They're more engaged in the world. There are all these natural experiments that I have collected to test male and females' innate abilities where there are institutions without gatekeepers. Nobody's keeping out the females and still males predominate. So whether it's subscriptions to public affairs journals, you know, like The Economist or The American Conservative or, or uh, you know, National Review, New Republic, males way, way oversubscribed compared to females. Nobody's preventing females from subscribing letters to the editor, Wikipedia entries, males predominate. So I have noticed when I go to colleges, if there's a group of sort of dissident students that just want to get together and talk about ideas that are maybe conservative, but generally without fear of, of ostracism, it's almost exclusively males. The females are not showing up. So that argues in your, uh, to, to your side that maybe they will start creating new institutions where they can be male, give full reign to their innate inclinations to explore, males gave us civilization because they wanted to take risk and they wanted to master the world through knowledge. And I hope that the K through 12 system, and then I am so cynical that I don't, 
I wouldn't put it out of the range of possibility that there's sort of, if we still have people actually getting pregnant any longer and not doing it all in vitro or surrogacy, some kind of testosterone blocker in the womb, if feminists continue to take over. But, but if they emerge from the womb with their innate inherited inclinations intact, I do hope that's, a, that's an interesting thought, Inez, that they create alternative institutions where they could be, be themselves. Now, the other thing that's needed for that is some kind of organizing mechanism. Like I, I think, how many followers does Ben Shapiro have? Does Michael Knowles have? Does Jordan Peterson? Is this a significant force? And how do we organize them as a political matter to take our culture back? Yeah, it's true. As I, I have advanced the hopeful assumption, uh, or sort of a hopeful um, assumption that, that the in arrogance of ambitious young men is somehow deeply uh, enduring. Exactly. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, yeah, on, on that last topic, we don't have time to get into it here, but I've cited it many other places. Uh, Heather has a fantastic article in City Journal uh, a few months back called The Feminization of the American University. Um, and, and I highly recommend you check that one out. But of course, uh, first, you should go over to Amazon or anywhere else and buy When Race Trumps Merit, Heather's latest book. Um, it is chock full of all of these examples. All the research apparently she did herself, I meaning there's page after page after page of basically basic facts. You, you're, this, this book, only in the introduction and in the conclusion, and maybe a few sentences here or there, are you even really expressing your opinion? You're just documenting the fact of the matter and the reason that these disparities exist and how that that hate that those hate facts are being treated and ignored in every one of these institutions uh, in turn. So I highly recommend uh, to my listeners they go out and buy When Race Trumps Merit by Heather McDonald. Heather, thank you so much for, for coming back on High Noon uh, to talk about this important book. Thank you so much, Inez. I'm, great to, I'm grateful for such a good conversation.